First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. First Peter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion or a bear, seeking whom he might devour. Resist him steadfast. We talked about standing this morning. Take a stand. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Well, I'd like to talk to you a little bit this afternoon about some practical tips in dealing with temptation. Now, we're all tempted. Uh, if anyone here says, well, I don't really struggle with temptation, that would really concern me. Because you know what that really says is that uh, you're worse off than you think. If you try to live the holy life, you are swimming against the stream. You're swimming against the current. You're going to feel that resistance. If you're just flowing downstream with the, the tide, then you say, oh, I, don't, I don't notice any problem. Well, it's probably because you're giving in to temptation. You just don't feel anything. But if you resist temptation, you're going to notice, uh, if you struggle with temptation, you're going to notice there's a battle. It's a battle that even Jesus faced, and it wasn't just once or twice, but through his life, Christ was tempted, the Bible tells us, in all points as we are, yet without sin. And the tools that Jesus used are available to you and me. A hundred percent of everything in the toolbox that Christ used to resist temptation is available to you and me. He did not gain victory over sin because he drew upon a supernatural power that is not available to us. You know, the Bible gives us many samples of people who have overcome. And uh, you want to make sure they're your heroes. And typically when we go through the Bible, we talk about the, we say, well, you know, we're all weak, and after all, look at David. And we, we, you know, I could talk all day long about people who have failed. We need to focus on some of those who succeeded. We all know how to fail already, right? We need to know how do we succeed? How do we get the victory? Let me give you another verse in 1 Peter chapter 1. It tells us about the tools that are available to us. It says that there are exceeding, oh, I said 1 Peter, no wonder I'm mixed up. It's in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, I apologize. According to his divine power, he has given unto us all things, how much? all things that pertain unto living this holy life, unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. He's called us to virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great, not just great, but exceeding great, not just great and exceeding great, but exceeding great and precious promises that, how? By these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Through the word of God, you and I have the privilege and the right to be partakers of the divine nature, and we can escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Yes, you can. Now, what I'm sharing with you right now is really where the rubber meets the road, and it's so exceedingly important. And I knew when I looked at the clock that I'd be sharing this information after you all had lunch on a beautiful day that there was the very real risk that uh, you could drift off and you could go into your, you know, uh, rapid eye movements. <laughs> so, if you love your brother, every now and then I want you to look to your right and I want you to give a sanctified elbow <laughs> and say, brother, I need this and you need this too. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna talk about some of the tips that are given in the Bible about how to resist temptation, how to be victorious. And by the way, I'm not saying this because I have arrived. I'm sharing these things with you as one of you. Believe me, uh, I have stumbled and fallen plenty. 
And uh, so I'm right in there with you, but I found that these things work, and so when you find something that works, you want to share it with somebody else. Uh, two nights ago, I was with John Lomacane, and we did a live program on 3ABN, and they get the studio so cold to keep because of all the lights and the camera equipment, it all generates heat. And I said, John, you know, the older I get, is my feet get so cold during these tapings. And that's why I started wearing boots. That and it adds about half an inch or an inch to me. <laughs> but uh, it really keeps my ankles. He said, Doug, you know, I wear three socks. I said, what? He said, yeah, I wear three pairs of socks. I said, three? He said, yeah, I started doing it playing basketball. Now even when I dress up, I wear three pair of dress socks. I said, John, I've known you for 25 years. Why didn't you ever tell me that? <laughs> says, I've been, and he probably buys his shoes a size bigger, too. But uh, any tip that helps a person to be successful is, is a precious thing, especially when we're all in this battle together. Amen? So just some things I have found that have helped me. And by the way, what I'm sharing with you, this is you know, a little more of a seminar. There is a booklet that you can simply download for free. In other words, the syllabus for what I'm sharing with you. Uh, I'm giving you kind of the expanded version. It's called 12 Tips to Overcoming Temptation, or 12 Tips to Resisting Temptation. And uh, you just you download that for free at Amazing Facts under the free library. All right, first thing to remember, from the positive perspective, remember the reward. You know, sometimes if you just keep your eye on the goal, there's nothing wrong with wanting to go to heaven. There's nothing wrong about thinking about the reward. Ultimately, we want to do God's will because we love God, because we love our fellow men. But you know, even Peter said, Lord, we've forsaken all to follow you, what will we have? And it's a valid question. Now, I believe that you've grown mature spiritually when you get to the place where you love the Lord so much, you're willing to say, no matter what's in it for me, if I don't get anything, Lord, if it'll glorify your name and if it'll save others, even if my name is taken out of the book of life, that's what Moses said, if it's doing your will, Lord, I'll do it. But until we get to that high level of spiritual maturity up there with Paul and Moses, then sometimes we want to say, Lord, I want to be on those golden streets. I want to be in a world where never, no one ever gets sick or nobody ever dies or there's no more pain. Amen? No more crying. And just think about the exceeding great and precious glory. That's why Paul said the sufferings of this world are not even worthy to be compared with what God has in store for those that love him and those that serve him. It's a lot easier to endure the darkness when you know the dawn is coming. And so don't forget where we're going. Don't forget that this life is not it. This is a very short, almost, no it is, microscopic period of time compared to eternity. But we become all consumed with this life, and this life is not it. This life is just the launching pad for eternity. But what you do with this life determines your eternity. And so don't forget eternity. Don't forget this is not it. Keep your eye on the goal that you, sometimes you think, oh boy, it's just day after day, this temptation. Well, think about millennium after millennium in Jesus' presence in heaven, eternal pleasures at his right hand with no guilt forevermore. Compared to the suffering of this life, it's nothing. But you know, we typically think like kids. You ask a kid, would you rather have 25 cents right now or a dollar in a week? And they'll say, well, I want it now. Would you rather have the ice cream cone right now or a gallon of ice cream in a month? Yeah, and they'll say, I want it now. It's almost a sign of, uh, of childishness. But some of us haven't grown up either. We're thinking this is it. Or you know what? In our minds we think, what if I don't make it? What if this is my only life? You know that old beer commercial, you only go around once, you better grab all the gusto you can right now. And so we want to hedge our bets and say, well, what if I try so hard to be a Christian and I, I deny myself the sinful pleasures and I still don't make it? You're still better off because for everything you do, you will be rewarded. And if you're not, there are varying degrees of reward and there are varying degrees of punishment. So you're always better off doing the right thing whether you're saved or lost. Have you ever thought about that? You're always better off doing the right thing, so don't get discouraged. Keep your eye on the eternal reward. Believe in the badness of sin. 
not only is it the goodness of God, but one of the characteristics of the overcomers in the Bible is they recognize the badness of sin. Matter of fact, uh, why don't you turn, we've got a case study here I mentioned earlier, I was going to talk briefly about Joseph. And if you turn to the book of Genesis, we all know the story, Genesis chapter 39, Joseph's been sold by his brothers, and he's out in uh, Egypt now. He's auctioned off to a man named Potiphar. He, things go well, actually, for a slave. He begins to work his way up from scrubbing floors so that he's over everything Potiphar has. And you've got to be careful. You know, after a series of victories, sometimes that's when the devil gets you. It was after David had a series of victories that the Bathsheba incident came. And it's after Joseph was being promoted in Potiphar's house so that pretty soon he's in charge of everything, that's when the great temptation came. And so uh, you've got to be on your guard. Someone said, uh, well, I'll, I'll save that for later. Come back, you'll find out what someone said. This is Genesis chapter 39, verse 7. So it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. And she said, lie with me. Now, do we all know what that means, or do I need to break that down? <laughs> break it down. No, I'm not. <laughs> but he refused. And he said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house and has committed all that he has to my hand. He trusts me. There is no one greater in his house than I, nor has he kept back anything for me but you because you are his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph understood how bad it was. Sometimes I think we forget it's not only appreciating the goodness of God, we've got to recognize sin is exceedingly sinful. And when we understand how wicked it is, it, it makes a big difference. You know, um, I was raised in the world. And I try and find delicate ways to say this, but uh, living immorally, you know, I, I had sort of a natural understanding within that it was wrong. I think everybody has a certain amount of God's law written in their hearts. And without meaning to be disrespectful, it was really no thanks to my mother and father because my mother's attitude was, just don't get anybody pregnant. I mean, from just a teenager on, as long as I could remember. And, that's kind of the way my parents lived. Both of them, my mom was married four times, my dad was married five times, and there were a lot of relationships in between. And, well, I, I can't tell you everything, but I'll leave it to your imagination. Just, I grew up with no understanding about the sanctity of marriage and of keeping your body holy and virtuous and the value of that. And it was after becoming a Christian and reading in the Bible, finally the concept dawned on me, the sinfulness of sin. You know, we're surrounded by a culture that's saying that whatever you feel good, whatever feels good, do it. And that's to be your criteria. But God says that may be the standard of the world, but that's not my standard. There are some things that are right and there's some things that are wrong. And the same way that an enemy will try and soften up its opponent by bombardment before it sends in the ground troops, the devil tries to soften up our revulsion to sin so that it doesn't seem so bad. Now, I catch a lot of heat for this, but in California, you know, they've got a big battle about gay marriage. I guess they do in several states now. And even growing up in the world, uh, I understood that just ain't right. That there's something very wrong and perverted about that. And then when I opened up the Bible, it was further confirmation what we should all know is just, you know, what they call the certain truths are self-evident. And it should be self-evident in most of the world that men and women are what should get married. That, uh, can I have an amen, please? <laughs> Unless you've been softened up also. You know, the devil has been trying to normalize something perverted. And it's not even safe for me to say something that is just so basic. But that's the way he does with all of our things. We get so overexposed to these things that pretty soon you're so like, well, you know, everybody's doing it. And the stuff that would have made people blush 
20 years ago barely gets a reaction these days because we've been softened up by the enemy. One of the character characteristics of Job, he was a perfect and upright man, one who feared God and noticed this, he hated, he eschewed evil. He loved God, he hated what was bad as well. And so pray that God will help you to recognize how deadly sin is, how contagious it is, because we toy with it. And it's, what, it's not only what kills us, but uh, it's what killed Jesus. Jesus died because of sin. If you had a child that was stabbed to death, would you take a photograph of the knife and wear it on your t-shirt? Or would you be revolted by the sight? And when you think about what Jesus experienced in his suffering, it was because of sin. So for us to trifle with sin, to make light of sin, uh, is really applauding what the devil has done. And so we've got to understand the badness of sin. Love people, not things. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And it's not that the paper money or money of itself is bad, but it's because people often use people to get things. They use and manipulate people to get money. You should love people and use money. Money is to be used, not people. And sometimes we get that backwards and we, we're preoccupied with how many things can I acquire? Let me read something to you. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and har harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Some people get involved in gambling because they want to get rich quick or crazy multi-level marketing schemes because they're trying to get rich quick and people are always tracing this elusive dream because they want to get things. Our garages are full of things. We become, can't go away on a mission trip because who's going to watch our stuff? And you can get to the place where we become prisoners of our things and I think that the devil to a great extent has succeeded to weigh down the church of God with stuff so that we're not free to work for God or love of stuff. And so people fall into temptation. Well, you know, the Bible says temptation is really divided in three areas. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And a lot of people, they see something, they think, I've got to have it, and, or it'll exalt their, their pride. Point number four. Be prepared to quickly run. Be prepared to flee. I want to go back to my story of Joseph here. Notice it says in verse 10, she's, he said, this is great wickedness in verse 9. How can I do this and sin against God? And in verse 10, so it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. He did everything he could to totally avoid being around her. If you know that something is a risky area, and we spoke about this earlier, don't go anywhere near it. Some people are caught by temptation because they don't flee temptation, they crawl away from it and they hope it catches them. They linger near the edges, sort of hoping that they'll be overcome. And if you know that an area is a weak spot for you particularly, you avoid that area. Recognize and make a covenant with yourself. You know why young people get into trouble? They get into a situation where you get the young guy and the young lady, and when they're with their friends and everything, that's one thing. It's when they get by themselves. Uh, so who was it? Uh, C.D. Brooks had said, a banana never gets in trouble till it leaves the bunch. And a lot of young people, if they would just make up their mind, and I guess it could happen to older singles too, that, uh, you know, whenever, whenever I'm with the opposite sex, I'm going to make sure that, uh, you know, we're in some kind of public venue. It's when you get all by yourself and you start kind of just having the, the friendly touching and intimacy and start playing with Mother Nature, things begin to happen that you can't stop. And so avoid those areas of temptation. Joseph wouldn't even be with her. And as soon as she put her hands on him, what did he do? He, he ran. He fled. You've just got to act like it's the plague. 
So flee temptation. How do you do that? Draw near to God. This is James chapter 4, verse 7. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. You submit yourself to God, resist the devil. The devil will flee from you. You draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So uh, stay away from the areas of temptation and sin. And this is how Joseph was able to get the victory in this case. Don't follow the crowd. The idea that everybody's doing it and so it must be okay, this is common logic that's used. What does Jesus say about the crowd? Follow not a multitude to do evil. There's one statement there in uh, Exodus. Matthew chapter 26, verse 35. Um, Peter, you know, they'll say everybody's doing it. Peter said in Matthew uh, 26, verse 35, even if I have to die with you, I'll not deny you. When Peter was with his friends, he was somewhat controlled by the crowd. He said, oh, Lord, I'll die for you. It's easy when we're in a venue like this to say, amen, praise the Lord, let's live for Jesus, let's be men of faith. But when Peter was surrounded by a different group that was now making fun of Jesus, he fell right in line with the crowd and started saying, I don't know who he is. So do you stand up just as much for Jesus when you're uh, separated from your support group? Think of it this way. You're always with a crowd of believers. Are angels watching you? Yeah, we're always on video. Think about that for a minute. Everything you do is being recorded these days. I know a little while ago I got something in the mail and it says it was a traffic violation. And before I even read everything in the envelope, I thought, what, illegal U-turn? No, I didn't. I don't remember ever even being in that town. And I pulled out what was in the rest of the envelope. It was a picture of me doing an illegal U-turn, <laughs> looking very intent. <laughs> they got cameras everywhere now. I could probably teach driver's education if I had to. <laughs> but uh, Jesus said, if you will confess me before man, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. You remember when Jesus, uh, in the book of Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, Jesus says to the devil, have you considered my servant Job? Was Jesus aware of Job? Were the angels watching Job? Angels are intent looking into what's happening here in this world, so you're not alone. So if you're going to please a crowd, don't please the devil's crowd. Stand up for Jesus. Christ, even when he was hanging on the cross, he said, don't you know I can pray and my Father will send a legion of angels? They're watching me right now. Do you believe that? Do you believe there are angels in this room? Probably not just good ones, but there are evil angels too. And they're trying to sedate us so that we don't hear what the Spirit is saying. But there's good angels, and when we're tempted, and when we resist temptation, in your mind, just imagine, there are a, an army of angels, a whole stadium of angels that are watching what you're doing, and they're cheering. So you get to choose every time you're tempted. Who do you want to cheer? Do you want the devil's angels to cheer, or do you want God's angels to cheer? Don't follow the crowd. Stay busy. Somebody said, I think it's a, an Italian proverb, he that labors is tempted by one devil, he that is idle is tempted by a thousand. A lot of times we get in trouble with temptation because we don't have anything to do. When God first made man, how did God make man? Part of the Sabbath commandment is not just rest on the seventh day, what's the other part? Is it a suggestion that six days you should work, or is it a command? The command about working is just as real as the command about resting. Six days thou shalt labor and do all your work. And anyone here all out of work? Let me see your hands. Have no work left? <laughs> I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about when you go home. There's always stuff to do, right? We're to be busy. God made man for activity. He wants us to use our minds. He wants us to be creative. Hopefully you've got work that you enjoy. But when you're engaged and when you're busy and when you're active, when you've got plans, that'll keep you from a multitude of temptations and sin. When you think about the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? 
Well, of course, that's where they get the word uh, sodomy. You think about it. The homosexuality, what was going on with Lot and the uh, bad reputation they had for that. But you know, the Bible records that was not the only thing they were destroyed for. Lot had daughters that were married to men in the city. Not everybody in the city was gay. One of their sins was pride, fullness of bread, and idleness. Idleness. You can read about that. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49 and 50. You've heard the expression, idleness is, in, is the devil's workshop. Uh, that verse is not actually in the Bible, but it says, speaking of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, they had an abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. Now, are we in a country that has an abundance? So, you know, farms used to be operated, about all a person could handle was 160 acres. And if you ever drive through Texas, every 10 miles you'll see a town. It's kind of sad now because you drive across Texas and every 10 mile, every 10 miles in almost any direction, there's a, just some kind of little sprouted town. You got Church of Christ, Methodist Church, Southern Baptist Church. Problem is most of them now are empty. There's just a few of those little towns where everybody kind of congregated, they became cities. And a lot of them just stayed little towns and died out. You know why? Because instead of one farmer and his family being able to handle 160 acres with these great big massive John Deere tractors that are almost as wide as this gym, they've got stereo and GPS and air conditioning and one farmer can go all day long and he can plow thousands and thousands of acres. But you know what that means is that there's an abundance of bread for everybody else. And so, and that's one thing that made this country great. But let's face it, we've got a lot of comforts, a lot of convenience, a lot of idle time. Now you personally may think, oh, Pastor Doug, I don't have any idle time. Well, good, maybe the Lord's keeping you out of trouble. But stay busy. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, sometimes we've got wives and they say, you're too busy. Anyone res resonate with that? You work too hard. You're a workaholic. And I'm not suggesting that. You can stay busy. She'll be happy if you do things with her. It's just not, it's not the idea of you're not doing anything. She just wants to be with you where you're doing stuff with her or with the family. But God doesn't want us to sit around and do a lot of nothing. He didn't create us for inactivity. Rest is good. Rest is important. That's why God gives us a Sabbath. But if you're not staying busy, chances are you're getting tempted a lot. And so, stay busy serving the Lord. Have a plan. This is point number seven. Have a plan for escape. We often stumble into sin because when we see temptation coming, we wait to see what will happen when it arrives. You want to be prepared in advance. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3, Solomon says, A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself. Don't wait to see what's going to happen or how you're going to act when there's some pop-up message on your computer. Get a pop-up blocker as soon as you get your computer. Get a security program on there. Prepare yourself in advance to avoid those kind of temptations. There's a lot of areas where uh, if you've got a problem with uh, eating junk food, don't bring the cookies home and then hope you can resist temptation. If they're in the house, you're going to have temptation. Don't bring them home from the store. You want to be able to plan ahead and, and uh, stay close to the Lord. The Bible says that if you've got some area in your life that you know is going to be a weak spot, Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not that your whole body be cast into hell. If you've just quit smoking and your friends still smoke, find some new friends. If you can, do what you can to avoid those areas of temptation. But you say, Pastor Doug, they've been friends for years. If you quit drinking and you quit smoking and they're still drinking and they're still smoking, how can I say, they're my friends. I mean, how am I going to reach them? 
pluck out your eye, cut off your hand. Of course, God's not talking about literally there. It's a symbol for even if it's something as close to you as a dear friend. Sometimes you've got to do something radical. I know some people, they say, Pastor Doug, I've got a problem with the Internet, but I'm at a job where I'm online every day and there's no kind of security and I've just got so much availability to my problem. And you know what I'll say to that person? Get another job. Some people say, Pastor Doug, you know, I've got a TV and I just can't control myself. What do I do? Get rid of your TV. Oh, but there's some good things on TV, but if you can't control it, cut off your hand. Get rid of your TV. What profit is it if you say, you know, I had a TV when I went to hell, but what good is that? So if you're struggling in these areas, yeah, I know you probably think, Pastor Doug, you're being a little radical. Well, maybe I am. But I think, you know what? Nobody's going to stand before the Lord in the judgment day and hear Jesus say to them, you know, I'd like to let you into the kingdom, but you got rid of your TV and you couldn't watch 3ABN and Amazing Facts anymore, so I can't let you in. That's not going to happen. If you've got to do something radical in order to get the victory, then do it. Amen? And you'll set a good example for your families about what your priority is. Sometimes the devil gets us with these things where we just we're trying to ride the middle of the line and, and we can't do it. You want to get as far away from temptation as possible. So have a plan for escape. Uh, a lot of temptation comes as, as little things. It nibbles away at our, uh, our weaknesses. Know yourself. The, the things that tempt you may not be the same things that tempt me. There are probably some general areas where we're all tempted. But you know, the, the devil knows how to uh, tailor his temptations. Uh, and frankly, I should probably back up and say something about this. When we say the devil is tempting me, it's typically not the devil himself. The devil's operating through his demons. And in the same way that God has guardian angels that know us and they guard us, and I'm looking forward to meeting my angel when I get to the kingdom, he'll probably be easy to recognize because he'll have gray hair and a straight jacket on. But uh, I think the devil has also, he's probably got demons that are appointed to bring us down. Matter of fact, there's a story in the Bible and the book of Acts where these seven young sons of some synagogue ruler, Sceva, he was an exorcist. They heard that Paul was going around and he was casting out devils in the name of Jesus and the demons would come out. They said, so what is it that Paul does? He says, in the name of Jesus, I cast you out. He said, okay, well, we're going to do what Paul does. They knew nothing about Jesus. They barely knew who Paul was. So they found this man who was possessed by the devil. They went to cast the devil out of this man and they said, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, come out of him. You know what the demon said? I know Paul and I know Jesus, but I don't know who you are. And so those de the devil's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. I think probably Satan has designated different demons or somehow organized. Satan's got his legions, doesn't he? And they're probably devils that have studied your weakness. Now, I don't, I don't uh, recommend C.S. Lewis across the board, but he wrote one thought-provoking book called The Screw Tape Letters, and I read that when I was up in the cave. It talks about how devils study our weaknesses, and they try and plan things that are tailored and a recipe based upon where you typically fall. So know yourself. Know what your weaknesses are. Make sure, as we mentioned, to avoid those areas of weakness and temptation. The devil doesn't really worry about me walking down some dark alley and having someone sell me heroin or crack cocaine. That's not my problem. He knows what they are, and I'm not going to tell you. And, but you know what your problems are. And so just be aware of that, and then just pray for strength specifically in those areas. Know yourself. There's a Spanish proverb that says, don't be a baker if your head is made of butter. And don't ever boast. We're all, we all have the potential to fall. One of the most important things we can do to get the victory is maintain a humble attitude and be aware of how weak we are. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. 
It's only moment by moment, trusting in God, we're able to live the victorious life. As soon as someone starts going around boasting and saying, you know, I, I haven't sinned all week long. Beware, take heed. Let him who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. Peter did that. Though all men should forsake thee, Lord, I'll not forsake thee. He said, you don't know yourself, Peter. Overcome evil with good. Now, whatever you're doing, you can find that there's usually a good way to overcome. If, if somebody's giving you a hard time and you're tempted to be angry or to talk bad about them, pray for them. If you're struggling with um, smoking, you throw away your cigarettes, get toothpicks. That's what I did. I carried around a box of toothpicks in my top pocket. It at least gave me the illusion I had a pack of Marlboro there, and whenever I was tempted to reach down and grab one, I'd actually cut a little square corner out so I could shake one out. And you know what? It really helped me. And people said, well, Doug, you look like a beaver, just chewing on toothpicks all the time. But I tell you, I'd rather look like a beaver than a chimney, right? And so, you know, you could apply this to your life a thousand different ways. When you find out that you've got some weakness, figure out what it is. If your problem is chocolate, get some grapes or some peanuts or something. But uh, just find something good to overcome the area of evil. If you're preoccupied and you say, oh, you know, Pastor Doug, I've, I've got a problem with DVDs and, and, you know, I just keep wanting to go to Blockbuster. Get an, get an Amazing Facts, a 3BN video or something to watch it, right? Overcome evil with good. Plan ahead. Think ahead about, you know, I always have a, a real time of weakness when I'm doing this or when I'm doing that. Think ahead and say, all right, Lord, I don't want to fall in that area again. And ask God to give you some wisdom about how you can overcome in those areas. Do not be overcome with evil. Romans 12, verse 1, be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So that's one of the ways that we uh, get the victory over temptation. Take care of your health. Now, you maybe didn't expect that. One of the real basic things that you can do to get the victory is take care of yourself as much as you can physically. Part of the health message, not only so you don't get sick and uh, die prematurely, so you can be a more effective witness and you have more energy, but another reason for the health message is it's easier for the devil to get us when we are sick and tired. Now, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands, but I think most of you would put up your hands and admit that sometimes if you've had a blow up in your family or an argument with your spouse or you yell at your kids, you get hungry, low blood sugar, you're more prone. You get tired, long day work, a lot of stress, you're fatigued, you come home, you didn't have enough sleep, and all of a sudden you snap and you say things that you wish you didn't say, and you, you fall. And one of the simple solutions for that is Take care of your health, get exercise, get rest, eat right, you eat a lot of sweet food, drink a cup of espresso, and you get all, you know, you're all hyperactive like that, and you're going to bite anybody's head off. There's reasons for the health message, you know, and some of them are it helps you avoid temptation. I have to be real particular as I travel a lot uh, and uh, kind of a heavy schedule to take care of my health. Not only because you know, I want to be well when I get somewhere so I can teach and preach, but I find I'm a better husband, I'm a better father, I'm a better Christian if I take care of myself. I can't overemphasize this, friends, that uh, there's a reason we've been given this health message, and part of the reason is that we can glorify God in our bodies when you take care of yourself. When did the devil come to Jesus and tempt him? After 40 days of fasting, he was weak, he was tired, he had low blood sugar, and that's when the devil came. And he just opened fire with everything he had. And, but don't forget this, even if you are tired, sometimes you can't control circumstances. Even if you are hungry. I've gotten on planes before where they ordered a veggie meal and all they had was some big old leg of lamb and I couldn't eat. You can't always control all these circumstances, but is that an excuse to sin? 
You can say, oh, well, Lord, you know, after all, I'm tired, so I'm absolved for yelling at the spouse without really uh, having a good reason. Is there a good reason to yell? <laughs> yell at your spouse? Take care of your health. Um, sometimes we understand the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, so you've got to take care of the flesh as well as you can. Recognize your way of escape. Be watching and uh, aware. Whenever I get on an airplane, you know how they go through the, the pre-flight list and they say, you know, make note of where your exits are? I'm a pilot and I fly all the time, but I still take a moment and I say to myself, in the unlikely event that I might need to use a different door to get out than what I used to come in, I'd like to know where it is. And in my mind, I, and it's not because I'm afraid, I just think it's part of being a good pilot, part of even being a good passenger. I think about, all right, just look around, be aware, Doug, how do you get out of here if you have to? And you know, sometimes you might find yourself in a situation where you're, you're going into a den of lions and the Lord's placed you in there. You might have to extricate yourself because you, you weren't aware that there were going to be things going on or temptations facing you that you weren't braced for. Know where the exits are and be prepared to run. You can be sure that in Joseph's story that we just read, when it says he arose and he fled, he knew which way to go, didn't he? It says he was, you notice it with uh, Potiphar's wife, and not only was Joseph a handsome young man, she probably didn't look that bad herself because Potiphar was a wealthy general, and you know, when you got a lot of money and prestige back then, it's possible that uh, he may have had uh, a pick of a, a fine wife. And Joseph said he wouldn't even be with her. But he had to come in the house to do some business. So I'm gonna just go back to that real quick. It happened about this time, I'm in verse 11 of chapter 39, when Joseph went into the house to do his work, that none of the men in the house was inside. He had to go in the house, but there was temptation in the house. So when he walked in, he made a note of where that door was because he recognized there was a problem in the house. That she caught him by his garment and said, lie with me. Was that subtle? You know, as Joseph could have rationalized, and one reason we get into temptation, let me just tell you some things that might have gone through his mind. These are some of the same rationalizations that happened to us. Joseph could have rationalized, well, there was one thing to resist temptation when she was asking me. But now this is my master, and the Bible does say, oh, slaves, obey your masters, and obey the laws of the land, and, uh, you know, what's going to happen to my paycheck if I hurt her feelings, and uh, then what's going to happen? What am I going to do about my retirement? and you can rationalize all kinds of things, and nobody's around, and after all, she's pretty strong. Maybe she's gonna force me. I mean, he could have just had all kinds of clever rationalizations in his mind, but he fought temptation. He, he probably knew that she was going to um, retaliate Someone said that hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, like a bear robbed of her whelps. And he probably could have thought, you know, if I spurn her advances this way, she's going to sense it as rejection and she'll retaliate. But who was Joseph interested in pleasing, man or God? And so he was determined to resist temptation, even if it meant he would not only maybe be demoted, not only would he stall in his position, but he might lose his life. He had his mind made up in advance. He said, this is great wickedness and I'll not do it. Joseph presents a great example for us of someone who had sterling integrity that was resolved to be pure. And all of us, by the grace of God, can be pure. So he fled and he ran outside. Now, what happened to Joseph when he resisted that temptation? She concocted a false accusation. He was arrested, thrown in jail, spent years in jail for doing what's right. Is it easier sometimes to just give in to temptation? 
to flow downstream? Let me word this differently. What's easier, going with the flow towards a waterfall of destruction or swimming against the current even though it requires more energy? Those are really the choices that all of us have. You can say, you know, swimming upstream is so hard, I'm just going to lay here on my uh, rubber raft and go with everybody else. The world is just so hard to swim against the tide. But off in the distance, you can hear ringing in your ears the crashing waters and you know you're perishing. Do you really enjoy the ride? How much better and even happier to swim against the current and to know that you're going to get to the other side? Did Joseph make it to the other side? He suffered. He suffered years as a slave. He suffered years in prison. But did he make it to the palace? Was he exalted? You know, there is pleasure in sin. I'd be lying to you. Whether it's the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes or the pride of life, there is at least some temporary pleasure in sin. But that's the problem. It's very short-lived, and there's almost always some form of hangover some form of regret, some form of guilt, some form of debt. I mean, you know, we could all divide up what our particular challenges are, and you know what that means. The real peace comes from seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness. There's going to be battles. Moses turned his back on the glories of Egypt that he might endure suffering with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And this is really what we're all grappling with. It's just these two choices. Don't be discouraged if you do fall. Now, I've got to spend a moment on that. This is one of the most important things. I won't ask for uh, a show of hands of how many have fallen, because that would be everybody. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But I want to tell you, you never need to fall. With every temptation, God will provide a way of escape that you are able to bear it. There is no temptation that comes to you that God does not first carefully measure how long a chain he's going to give to the devil. You realize that even when the devil came after Job, God measured off how far he would let the devil go. Is that right? Am I right? So God is on the throne, and he loves you, and he is not going to allow you to be tempted above what you're able. And with every temptation that comes to you, he is going to provide a way of escape that you can endure. it. Sometimes it will mean that way of escape is in the form of dropping on your knees. First thing you should do, as soon as you recognize temptation is there, submit to God and resist the devil. So you turn to God in prayer immediately, and that's where you get strength. But he is able to keep you from falling. That, by the way, is Jude chapter 1, verse 24. We want to abide in Christ. And don't beat yourself up if you fall. Now, this is an area where I pray God will give me wisdom to try and explain this to you. On one side of the equation, I want to tell you, don't beat yourself up if you fall. I don't want to so emphasize that you need to forgive yourself that you set yourself up to say, oh, well, I'll just forgive myself later and I'm going to fall. You need to be conscious of how dangerous it is to sin. Let me see if I could illustrate it this way. You all know what Russian roulette is? All right, suppose that you have a shotgun, a single-barreled shotgun. You all, men all know what I'm talking about. Single barrel. And you got one shell in the barrel. Can you play Russian roulette with that? Anyone here want to play Russian roulette with that? Now, if you understand math, what percentage of the time are you going to lose? 100% of the time. OK. Then let's say you've got a double-barreled shotgun but you've only got one shell in one of the chambers. And you hand it to your wife and say, pull one of the triggers. I heard a, um, someone was talking about a list of famous last words. It's interesting to read about people's famous last words. 
And one of the famous last words was, uh, this husband said to his wife, you couldn't hit the broad side of a barn with that gun. So you give this uh, double barrel shotgun to your wife and you tell her to pull one of the triggers. What are your chances now? About 50-50. Are right, you with me so far? Any of you willing to play that game? All right, now you got the typical six shooter and you spin the barrel and you cock it and you want to show your friends how manly you are and you pull the trigger. The Russians have to get pretty drunk to do that, but I guess that's where the name comes from. I've got a friend that uh, at a party back before I was a Christian, had a 38 revolver, held it up to another friend's head and he was going to pull the trigger and someone said, don't play like that. He said, it's not loaded. And he shot at his hand, blew right through his hand. And, uh, you know, I always tell my kids, don't ever point a weapon, even a toy weapon at somebody um, and play like that. So you got the six shooter. You roll it, your chances are now what? One out of six. Any of you want to play? But what if I tell you, you know, the other six times you're going to have pleasure? Does that make you enjoy it any better? All right, now you got a revolver. It's got 365 chambers in it. One for every day of the year. Anyone want to play? Oh, yes, you do. Who are you kidding? You do want to play. You do play. How many times have we gambled with temptation and we say, well, I probably won't die right away. God's so merciful and he's so gracious that this, you know, I'll probably have a chance to repent and confess before the shell goes off. And really, that's the way a lot of men go through their lives, is we flirt with sin and we say, well, you know, God is so merciful, I probably can get away with this and then ask him to forgive me later. Now, here's what I want you to understand. God is merciful. God is long-suffering. You never need to doubt God's willingness to forgive you when you genuinely repent. But here's what the danger is. Men like to live on the edge. And so we get away with something and we say, hey, there was no shell in that chamber. I guess I can play this game one more time. One more time. One more time. And we start taking sin for granted. No, we start taking God's mercy for granted. We start taking his grace for granted. He's always willing to forgive you, but what happens is every time you play with temptation and repent, you begin to develop a callus where you can get to the place where you're not really appreciating the sinfulness of sin and how dangerous the game is that you're playing. Sin kills. The penalty for sin is what? And if you doubt that it's deadly, look at Jesus. God so loved you that he gave his son to die in your place for your sins. So why would you want to keep flirting with sin and temptation like that? It's so deadly. And that, by the way, is the, the best thing to remember is that God's mercy is always available when we are willing to genuinely repent. So if you do fall, and we all fall, don't get discouraged. The Bible promises in 1 John, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And you may often, Spirit of Prophecy tells us in the book Steps to Christ, you may often have to kneel and weep at the feet of Jesus for your shortcomings and your sins. Don't get discouraged. Get back up again. I'll tell you when you need to be a little frightened is when after 20 years of following Christ, you don't see any growth. If you're still giving into temptation the same way now and as frequently now and you're falling now as much as you did when you were a baby Christian, then maybe you're not growing. If you've got little babies and when they're learning to walk, they stumble and they fall, but they get back up again, you don't think too much of it, they're babies. But then if they get to the place where they're 11 years old and they still can't walk, how many of you are going to take them to see the doctor? You realize there's a problem there. Are you growing in grace? When you look back, you say, well, praise the Lord, he's given me victory. I don't have that problem anymore. 
You should be growing in, in maturity, growing in grace, becoming more like Christ, and he can help you do that. All things are possible through Christ. Do you believe that? Erwin W. Lutzer said, our response to temptation is an accurate barometer of our love for God. The best reason to resist temptation is because we really love Jesus. So, what does it mean if we're falling frequently? If that's a barometer of our love for the Lord, if you loved him better, we'd probably serve him better. So what if you don't love the Lord enough? What do you do? I'd like to suggest if you know him better, you'll love him better. How do you get to know him better? Spend time with the Lord in your devotions. You know, whenever you're aware of God's presence, it's a lot easier to resist temptation. When you know that the Lord is right with you, spend time in his word every day. Are you doing that? If nothing else were to come from this conference, if the men would have a revival in their personal devotions, I can guarantee you it would play itself out into a higher standard of Christian living, spending more time with the Lord. That's where the ammunition is. That's where the sword is. That's where the spirit is, through walking with Christ. If you love him better and you love him more, you'll serve him better. Is that your desire, friends? Is that your prayer? Why don't we stand together and we'll close this session. And uh, don't forget there, the tips to temptation, uh, you can download this syllabus there at the Amazing Facts website and uh, we'll put these things into practice. Let's pray.